You're listening to Amy Keeps It Creepy, the podcast where I share my obsession with true crime and the paranormal with you. I'm your host, Amy Brooks. Poisoned peaches, an investigator obsessed with bodily fluids, a woman with a deadly case of denial. Today, we are talking about Typhoid Mary, the original chick with cooties. Hopefully you listened to my debut episode about that creepy bitch Lavinia Fisher and have already subscribed and checked out our website, creepypodcast.com. If not, and you like what you hear, please give the show five stars and subscribe on Apple Podcast or wherever you podcast so you never miss an episode. If you write a written review, make sure to screenshot your review and email it to info at creepypodcast.com and you will be entered to win my favorite creepy candle of the week from a candlestory.com. A candle story makes luxury hand poured artisan candles that smell absolutely amazing. Currently, they have several collections like Fairy Tale, Trailer Park Chic, and my personal favorite, the Creepy Candle Collection, where you can find candles like Psychopath, Haunted House, and The Husband Did It. Because it's always the husband. And don't you want to smell what a failed lie detector test smells like? I think I'm going to burn that one tonight. Go to acandlestory.com to pick up your creepy candle today or enter for your chance to win. Good luck. I love giving away free stuff to fans, so we will always have weekly giveaways on the show. Check out our website, creepypodcast.com, or on Instagram at creepypodcast for all the latest show news and swag. Thank you for listening and being a part of this creepy community. If you have a personal creepy true crime or paranormal story that you would like to share on the show, I know you do. Please email a brief description to info at creepypodcast.com. I can't wait to get creeped out. This week, our candle is Patient Zero. (laughs) Definitely a candle everyone wants right now. I love the label. It's a picture of a couple kissing, wearing face masks. Classic. It's done in a dot print, so it kind of looks like one of those Lichtenstein paintings. You know, the pop artist whose art is reminiscent of a comic book? Not only is it a beautiful candle in heavy glass with a glass lid that seals shut, it smells so unbelievable. The scent is listed as day drinking, double chocolate fudge ice cream, and social distancing. Yep, that pretty much sums up my last six months. I had this candle burning in my house the other day, and the whole place smelled of chocolate deliciousness. My kids thought I was baking. Then I had to bake. (laughs) Because I can't take the look of disappointment my son gave me when he realized the smell was burning wax and not a chocolate cake. Then we had chocolate cake and patient zero candle burning. Definitely made our staying in place a little better that day. Pick up a patient zero candle at acandlestory.com. Or there is a chance to win one of these candles for my listeners. Follow the Amy Keeps It Creepy Instagram page at Creepy Podcast for your chance to win. That's it. You are going to do it anyway. Follow at Creepy Podcast and you will be entered. There are several other chances to win fun stuff that you can find on the at Creepy Podcast Instagram page or on our website, creepypodcast.com. As always, Patreon fans are automatically entered in anything we give away. Good luck. With the current state of our lives with the pandemic, I've thought a lot about infectious disease lately, as I'm sure we all have. My great-grandmother, in fact, died from the Spanish flu epidemic, which is the last time America had to social distance and wear a mask. So I thought a look back at history's most famous super spreader, Typhoid Mary, was in order. I don't know about you all, but I've been hit really hard psychologically by living in L.A., one of the hot spots of the epidemic. Honestly, I don't leave my house. I closed my studio and office space and built a sound studio here at my home. All of my editing is done through Zoom with the sound engineer, Jason Grow. He's been amazing working remotely. Thank you, Jason. So I just spend all day and night working. I write, podcast, work on pre-production for films I'm producing, 
I'm editing a film I wrapped before the lockdown called Teen Witches, but I am depressed. And I think the ghosts in the house are wiggy too because there has been so much weird stuff going on in my house. Lights going on, lights going off, TVs going on, TVs changing channels, TVs volume going up. That particular TV is in the living room where most of the stuff happens. And I just unplugged it because I'm sick of being woken up in the middle of the night and being frightened, basically. (laughs) It's too creepy for me. And there's more. Cabinets open, cabinets close, uh, voices being heard, like audible voices like someone is in the room with you. I'm not kidding. Voices being heard. The other day, I was washing my face and baby C was in her crib in my room crying. I told her, mom, you'll be right there. I'm washing my face. Then a man in the bedroom says, she'll be right back. Like to my daughter. Um, and baby C stopped crying. I naturally thought it was my husband. There are no other men in the house. Go back in my room. There's no one there except for baby C and She seems fine. She's just like hanging out. (sighs) I look for my husband. I think for sure he's in the house. No, he's outside in the guest house. My kids are asleep. My other kids freaked me out. It was as loud as any living person's voice. And it was a man's voice. (sighs) I've been documenting this stuff. I've been filming it in a series called Pajama Time Ghost Hunt. (laughs) Because I can only ghost hunt at night in my pajamas when the kids are asleep. They don't know what's going on. I mean, my son has said he has seen a female ghost in the house twice. And I do not talk about the paranormal to my kids. They are too young. They believe in Santa and the Tooth Fairy. Although my daughter has mentioned to me that she thinks it's creepy that a fairy comes into her room at night and buys her teeth for a dollar. And I kind of have to agree with her. But my kids are innocent and they should be that way for as long as possible. When they ask me about spirits and what happens to you when you die, I tell them that when people die, they go to heaven. And when they ask me about my podcast or the creepy things I write about or produce, I tell them it's all made up. It's movie magic. I've identified two spirits in the house through EVPs and research I've done about the history of the property, who lived here, who's died here. And I'm releasing all the episodes for my Patreon supporters on patreon.com backslash creepy podcast. And I'll have the address also in my show notes. Definitely something to check out. But infectious disease has always freaked me out. In my normal life before COVID and the new normal, I was an admitted germaphobe. I just like being clean and I don't like getting sick. What's wrong with that? People call me a germaphobe like it's a bad thing to want people to wash their hands and not cough on me. Okay, I've seen too much and heard too much. Seriously. I used to be friends with this chick who was part of a long line of Hollywood elite who had herpes. The guy who had given it to her was so proud of having it because he was a total star effer and got it from the source, who was a famous actress. Known, by the way, for her wholesome roles, even though she's getting around all over town. No slut shaming or anything, but kind of, yes. America would be shocked to know that she is the queen of a long herpes line in Hollywood. Condoms, people. Typhoid Mary's real name is Mary Malone. She immigrated to New York to live with her aunt and uncle in 1883 as a teenager from Cookstown, County Tyrone, in what is now Northern Ireland. No known information is available about her life before that, but I'm sure she came to America to seek opportunity like my Irish ancestors did. And how brave to get on a ship alone as a teenager and head off to New York City. Big difference from what she was accustomed to. In 1883, the population of Cookstown was less than 4,000. It's still only about 12,000. There are like 4,000 people who live on my street alone, so I can only imagine what a small town it must have been compared to New York City. 
Like many single women who immigrated from Ireland, Malone found work in America as a maid, but her talent was in the kitchen. She worked her way up the ladder and eventually cooked for some of New York City's most elite families. In 1900, she worked in Mamaroneck, New York, the birthplace of Kevin Dillon, who I did a movie with called True Crime. Very nice guy. Within two weeks of Mary's employment, residents developed typhoid fever. Typhoid is a disease caused by a specific type of salmonella. The bacteria salmonella typhi, I think it's pronounced typhi or typhi, transmitted through ingestion of contaminated food or water. Symptoms include diarrhea, fever, and headaches, and can lead to septicemia and even death. (laughs) Okay, before the advent of antibiotics, typhoid fever had a death rate of anywhere between 10 and 30%. However, an individual can be asymptomatic and still carry the disease. So, family sick with typhoid, Mary took off for her next job. In 1901, she moved to Manhattan, where members of the family for whom she worked developed fevers, diarrhea, and the laundress died. Oops. Then she took off again. Malone then went to work for a lawyer and left after seven of the eight people in the household became ill. Uh, oops again. She left and found another job. Are you seeing a pattern here? Because I am. In this new position, within two weeks, 10 of the 11 family members were hospitalized with typhoid. Jesus. Okay, didn't anyone check references in 1906? They would clearly see a pattern here. She never stayed very long at any of her positions. And people always got sick. And many died. I'm sure there were only so many available jobs for cooks in rich households. Those jobs are hard to come by, especially with all the competition to get into a good house. She changed jobs again and again and again. Three more households, all developing typhoid. Typhoid seemed to follow Mary's career path. Hmm, coincidence? she finally landed a job with the family of a wealthy banker named Charles Warren. When the Warrens rented a house in Oyster Bay for the summer of 1906, Malone went along too. Within weeks, six members of Warren's household contracted typhoid fever. They couldn't believe it. They were wealthy. They were in Oyster Bay, the playground of New York's rich and famous, and home to Theodore Roosevelt's summer White House. Typhoid fever was viewed as a disease of crowded slums associated with poor people. Enough was known at that time that typhoid was spread in places that lacked basic sanitation. Well, what do rich people think about when everyone gets sick at their lucrative summer rental? Well, that news of the breakout would prevent them from leasing out their summer house ever again. Reputation is everything. Warren's landlord immediately hired an expert to investigate the origin of the exposure. That expert was George Soper, a freelance sanitary engineer who had investigated other sources of typhoid fever outbreaks. What a crap job! Literally, being a sanitary engineer, boy, oh boy. He tested everything in the house, from the house's plumbing to the local shellfish supply. Everything came back negative. Immediately, though, Soper had a feeling. He suspected the cook, Mary Malone, who had mysteriously left her post shortly after the outbreak. Of course she did. Soper researched Malone's employment history. Finally, someone vets her and found that seven families for whom she had cooked since 1900 had reported cases of typhoid fever which had resulted in the infection of 22 people and the death of one girl. All of the families reported having had an Irish cook in their employ when they contracted the illness, who looked to be about 40, tall, heavy, single, and appearing to be in perfect health. Oh my God, she was 40 and cooking for people since, I don't know, when do you think, when she was a teenager, at least in her 20s when she first got her cooking job? How many other people did she kill that Soper couldn't identify? (sighs) So scary. Soper knew 
he had discovered patient zero. However, he was unable to locate her because, well, she generally left after an outbreak began without leaving a forwarding address. Check out the Amy Keeps a Creepy Patreon page, where patrons get commercial-free early access to Amy Keeps a Creepy each week and are automatically entered in our weekly listener giveaways. Patrons also unlock exclusive videos and bonus podcasts. I post cool stuff on a weekly basis, so you have to check it out. The latest video series is my pajama party ghost hunt of my own house, which, yes, is haunted by not one, but two ghosts that we actually identify in the series through EVPs and historical research. Believe me, I'm equally terrified as I am annoyed at my realtor for not answering my question honestly when I asked her if the house had a paranormal past. Oh, trust me, it's creepy. And for even more creepy fun, there's an exclusive tier that gets monthly candles from a candle story and an even more exclusive tier that gets a monthly Zoom call with me to discuss all things creepy. It's going to be so much fun. Go to patreon.com backslash creepy podcast, or you can also find the link in the show notes or on our website, creepypodcast.com. Finally, Soper learned of an active outbreak in a penthouse on Park Avenue and discovered Malone was the cook. Two of the household servants were hospitalized and the daughter of the family died of typhoid. Soper approached Malone about her possible role in spreading typhoid and requested urine and stool samples. <laughs> I can only imagine how that conversation went. She's like, who is this guy? Some rando guy shows up demanding your pee and poo to analyze? Well, Mary wasn't having it. She became angry and violent, lashing out at him with a carving knife. On his next visit, oh, this guy was obsessed with her, I know it. He took Dr. Josephine Baker of the New York City Health Department. She was equally vicious as before, coming out fighting and swearing. They had commented that she had a particular talent for this and did it with such appalling efficiency and vigor. <laughs> what did she say? The writer in me wants to know. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall to hear what Mary said, her being efficient at curse words. During a later encounter, how many times did he hit her up for samples is unclear, but I have no doubt that Soper was stalking her and her pee. He told her he would write a book and give her all the royalties. Mary Malone was his book deal. He knew he was on to a great story. Well, she angrily rejected his proposal and locked herself in the bathroom until he left. You'll never get my pee and poo. With the help of the New York Department of Health and numerous police, Mary was finally detained after evading authorities for five hours. They only found her because her dress was caught in the door she was hiding behind and a cop saw the fabric. <laughs> Classic dress in the doorway. Uh, her samples were forcibly taken. That sucks. She tested positive for typhoid. But Mary felt fine, always had. And she felt that the samples were unjustly taken. She did not want to give up the pee and poo. Although Mary harbored the extremely contagious bacteria that caused typhoid fever, she never demonstrated any of its symptoms. Immune to the disease herself, Malone was the first person in the United States identified as an asymptomatic carrier of the pathogen, which meant that she could spread the disease without experiencing any of the disease's symptoms. So dangerous. We hear about asymptomatic carriers of COVID all the time now, but at the time, this was new science. It was a new concept of someone being sick and not showing any symptoms. Malone had the misfortune to be one of these healthy carriers. Many of the people to whom typhoid Mary spread the disease experienced a high fever for several days, headaches, abdominal pain, and rose-colored spots. Not sure where those rose-colored spots were located, but I'm sure they weren't pretty. No wonder this chick was single. 
Throughout her life, Mary fervently denied having typhoid. How is this possible? It is so hard for me to believe that she didn't know something was up as people got sick wherever she went. If not a disease, did she think it was just bad luck, some kind of Irish curse on her that made every family she worked for sick? Huh. Doesn't make sense to me. If she didn't think it was because of her, why would she move on to the next job when the family would become ill? Doctors theorized that Malone likely passed along typhoid germs by failing to wash her hands before handling food. Ew! I'm just going to do a big ew! Everyone should wash their hands, especially when cooking for others. How rude can you be? Well, elevated temperatures necessary to cook food should have killed the bacteria. Soper wondered just how Malone could have transferred the germs. He found the answer in one of Malone's most popular dessert dishes, ice cream with raw peaches cut up. It was the peaches. Malone's legend grew almost immediately. A newspaper illustration conveyed the public's morbid fascination with her. An aproned woman casually drops miniature human skulls into a skillet like eggs. (laughs) Oh, that's a great picture. I have the photo on creepypodcast.com or on my Instagram at creepypodcast if you want to check it out. Today, the name Typhoid Mary stands for anyone who callously spreads disease or evil. There's even a Marvel comic book villain named after her, a female assassin with a vicious temper. But can you imagine having your name be synonymous with cooties? I always refuse to audition for commercials with awkward topics that might make me undateable, like herpes pills or some douche product. You got to pass on those, even though they pay well. My agent was always trying to get me out on those campaigns. But who wants to be the poster girl for the chick in need of vaginal freshness? No. And I'm not famous enough to be part of the herpes Hollywood elite. The Department of Health forcibly moved Mary to 16-acre North Brother Island, a dot of land in the East River just off of the Bronx that housed a quarantine facility. Okay, fast forward. This place, North Brother Island, is now abandoned and said to be haunted. I want intel on this place. If you've been there and I can have you on the show, it can be without your name because it is technically illegal to go there. I want to hear your paranormal stories. I was going to have a special about this to coincide with this episode, but the guy I was talking to, who is a photographer who sells photos of the place for a ton of money, didn't pass the pre-interview. Long story. But so much went on at that quarantine facility. The tuberculosis pavilion still exists, which I'm dying to know more about. Tuberculosis pavilion. I mean, what a name. How could it not be haunted? Seriously. Mary was forcibly confined inside a bungalow with only a fox terrier as her companion. Well, at least she had her dog. I never had typhoid in my life and have always been healthy, Malone wrote. Why should I be banished like a leper and compelled to live in solitary confinement with only a dog for a companion? Malone in 1909 sued the health department for her freedom, but the New York Supreme Court denied her petition. Where did Malone get the money to hire a lawyer and pay the legal bills? Some say it was William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper mogul, who liked to help people whose stories interested his newspaper readers. And Typhoid Mary was big news. During her three years at the quarantine facility, Mary was forced to give more stool and urine samples. (laughs) I know I'm talking about this a lot, but in my research... Doctors were constantly and forcibly taking samples from this chick, and she hated it. It made Mary incensed because she refused to believe there was anything wrong with her. She also refused to change her lifestyle and profession, which maybe would have got her out of the forced quarantine. It was even suggested that removing her gallbladder would help because they believed typhoid bacteria resided there. I can tell you right now, if Mary refused to pee in a cup, she wasn't letting anyone take her gallbladder. No. The New York State Commissioner of Health suddenly decided that disease carriers should no longer be kept in isolation and that Malone could be freed if 
she agreed to stop working as a cook and take reasonable steps to prevent transmitting typhoid to others. Okay, totally reasonable. Stop spreading your typhoid on others. Wash your freaking hands. On February 19th, 1910, Mary agreed and even signed an affidavit swearing to take hygienic precautions and would protect those with whom she came in contact from infection. She was released from quarantine and returned to the mainland. Upon her release, Malone was given a job as a laundress, which paid a lot less than cooking. After several unsuccessful years of working as a laundress, she changed her name to Mary Brown and returned to her former occupation as a cook, despite having been explicitly instructed not to and swearing to it. For the next five years, she worked in a number of kitchens. Wherever she worked, there were outbreaks of typhoid. However, as she did before, She changed jobs frequently, and Soper was unable to find her. (laughs) I'm telling you, he was obsessed. He's still after her. Oh, he just had a feeling. I know it. He knew that she was not going to stop. Well, in 1915, Malone started another major outbreak, this time at Sloan Hospital for Women in New York City. Twenty-five people were infected, and two died. Now, This was a maternity hospital. How evil can you get? Knowingly, because at this point, she has the diagnosis. She has the information. She knows that she could get people sick. She can kill people. She was in prison for three years already for it. (laughs) Something makes me believe that. Typhoid Mary is a creepy bitch. And then in her dark heart, wanted people to get sick. She was never going to fall in love, have a family, and the white picket fence. There are cartoons and jokes depicting her. No, she's undateable. She's Typhoid Mary. Why not make other people suffer? She's hateful. The epidemic was traced to the hospital's cook, whom the staff had jokingly nicknamed Typhoid Mary. Little did they know that it actually was Mary Malone who had taken the assumed name of Mary Brown. So funny, not funny. (laughs) Oh, wow. The health department had lost track of Malone after her release, during which time she cooked in hotels, restaurants, and institutions. This chick gets around, spreading her typhoid funk all over. And she stepped it up because there are so many more people to infect when you are cooking in a restaurant or hotel rather than a single family. Police were finally able to find her and arrest her when she took food to a friend on Long Island. Oh, can you imagine? Not a friend. Wow, not a friend. Check your friends. My God, what a bitch. After arresting her, public health authorities returned her to quarantine on North Brother Island on March 27, 1915. She was still unwilling to have her gallbladder removed. Malone remained confined for the remainder of her life. She became a minor celebrity and was occasionally interviewed by the media. (laughs) Interesting factoid. They were told not to accept even water from her. Like, who would? Seriously, who's going to take any food or water from her? Uh, Later, she was allowed to work as a technician in the island's laboratory washing bottles. I don't understand this at all. Why was she allowed to wash anything or touch anything in a laboratory? (laughs) Okay. Malone spent the rest of her life in quarantine, continually protesting her innocence and well being. Six years before her death, she was paralyzed by a stroke. On November 11th, 1938, she died of pneumonia at age 69. A post mortem found evidence of live typhoid bacteria in her gallbladder. That's awesome. She could have just had her freaking gallbladder removed and maybe she would have had a normal life and not ruined so many others. The public were still grossed out by her typhoid cooties and demanded a cremation. Malone's body was cremated and her ashes were buried at St. Raymond's Cemetery in the Bronx. Her obit in the New York Times attributed to her 51 cases of infection 
and three deaths and indicated that only nine people attended her funeral mass. I wonder if Soper was there. Among the infections Malone caused, at least three deaths were attributed to her. However, because of her use of aliases and refusal to cooperate, the exact number is not known. Some have estimated that she may have caused more than 50 fatalities. That's bananas. Oh. Other healthy typhoid carriers identified in the first quarter of the 20th century include Tony Lambella, an Italian immigrant presumed to have caused over 100 cases with five deaths. And then there's this other guy, dubbed Typhoid John. Aw, him and Typhoid Mary should have totally hooked up. They could have been the typhoid couple. (sighs) It's not funny, really. (laughs) Especially what's going on today. Think of the knowing COVID super spreaders out there right now. It's, It's terrifying to think about, especially because this is happening in our lives now. Is there a COVID Chris lurking about? Today, typhoid Mary is a colloquial term for anyone who knowingly or not spreads disease or some other undesirable thing. Now, there are some controversy and conspiracy theories out there. Although hundreds, if not thousands of asymptomatic carriers walked the sidewalks of New York freely, typhoid Mary alone lived in exile in large part due to the public opinion that turned firmly against her after her failure to stay out of the kitchen. Some say she would have never been treated in such a way if she had only gotten poor people sick and not the New York elite. Others say she never even had the disease, which Mary adamantly declared to anyone listening. Regular stool samples officials had taken from Mary proved mostly positive, but samples she had sent to a private lab all tested negative. I don't know. Today, Malone's case is archetypal in bioethics literature. As scholars debate when the government is justified in depriving someone of their freedom for a perceived greater good. Well, I believe Mary was a malicious, callous murderer, plain and simple. She may at one time have been ignorant to her disease, a disease that she most likely contracted in utero. But come on, she was diagnosed She even swore to stop cooking for others, but kept on cooking and escalated her cooking to larger groups of unsuspecting diners. That is evil. Typhoid Mary was nothing more than a creepy bitch and is surely fated to be alone and cook only for herself in death for all of eternity. And please, everyone listening, just wash your hands. If you share my obsession with creepy things, please subscribe and leave us a five-star review. If you screenshot a written review and email it to info at creepypodcast.com, you will be entered to win my favorite creepy candle of the week from acandlestory.com. Winners for all our giveaways are contacted directly and announced on our Instagram page at creepypodcast. Please check out our website, creepypodcast.com for all the terms and conditions, and the latest show giveaways. Thank you for listening. Toxic content.